Okay, everyone, it is 12.01 and we have a lot of great people tuning in. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for either logging onto Zoom or tuning in on Facebook to watch the first Let's Chat of 2021. Today, we are going to be talking about the history of the hooch. Uh, so that means the story of the river um, and how it has impacted the story of our cities or towns or people. Um, it's a really important, you know, part of our, our region of our own stories and our history. So we're just so excited. We have a number of local experts, historians, authors, panelists that are gonna be talking to us today um, about the whole region. Um, so before I hand it over to them, I did wanna let y'all know that we are not only recording, uh, but we are live on Facebook. So we're here on Zoom, but we're also on Facebook. So if you're watching on Facebook, hello. Um, we will be taking questions both ways. So if you do have a question at any time during this presentation, feel free to just share it in the chat here on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. I'll be looking at both and help, you know, I'll kind of share those with our presenters. I also wanna ask that if you are not presenting, you're not speaking, please go ahead and put your microphone on mute. It looks like everybody has done that. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, I'm happy to help you out. Um, and also if you could turn your video off, if your video is on, your beautiful face will be shown on Facebook too. Um, you know, if you're into that, that's great, but I do wanna let you know that that is how it works between Zoom and Facebook. Um, I am Julia Rajeski. I am CRK's communications manager. So I'm gonna be helping out with this webinar, this presentation. Um, and in case I haven't already mentioned it, if for whatever reason you do have to step away at any time during this presentation, we are recording it. So I will be sending out a link via email later on today. Um, and I will also be sharing that on our CRK Facebook. So feel free to hop off and then come back to it later. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm gonna go ahead and ask that David Greer turn his video and mic on. David is going to be talking to us about Helen and the Chattahoochee and Helen. And if anybody has been up there, I'm sure a lot of y'all have, you know that the river flows right through this really great city. So David, if you don't mind going ahead and telling us about yourself, that would be great. Sure. Um, my, my family came to Helen in about 1927. My grandfather was a uh, civil engineer and surveyor for the sawmill that um, was in Helen. Helen was um, founded as a sawmill town uh, in about 1917. Uh, I, I grew up in Atlanta, incidentally, uh, on Moore's Mill Road, about a half a mile from where Peachtree Creek comes into the Chattahoochee. So uh, the river's always been close to me for, for all my life. We, we, I, I didn't grow up in Helen, but I came up on weekends and summers and um, it was just a, a part, part of growing up. It has gone through a lot of changes since, since that time. And uh, it's, I think one of the questions that Julia had for, for me was what, you know, how has the river impacted settlement? And, and honestly, like any other significant water source, especially fresh water source, it, it, it was, a key role even in the since the beginning of time basically for settlement you know that the Native Americans settled here some say as early as 10,000 years ago uh, paleo Indian period but definitely uh, down the road Nikuchi Valley the the Indian mound in Nikuchi Valley was a big settlement um, about 700 800 years ago or, or, or longer um, but since that time, uh, obviously there's been a lot of changes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and thank you, David, could you, could you talk to us a little bit about those changes? I mean, like you said, Helen has evolved so much over sure. time. Um, what role did the river play, um, in the growth of the city? Yeah, well, all, all through the, through the, the history of the area here, you know, the river's been a key key resource and a, and a key uh, element uh, to the development. Uh, e even um, after the, the Native Americans were removed, gold, you know, part of the reason they were remo removed was because of the discovery of gold. 
the uh, water resources here were a key part to the to the gold prospecting. They they would actually even like Duke's Creek, which is a tributary to the to the Chattahoochee. They would uh, they tapped into it up at Duke's Creek Falls and and had hydraulic mining uh, happening uh, by tapping into that water and bringing it down the mountainside. So there was there was there were basically I, I have a book I wrote about Helen, <laughs> but uh, the way I've always kind of there there was the pre settlement period during the uh, um, Native American times there was then there was gold discovery and the gold period. And then, then after that was the sawmill. The sawmill came to Helen. Helen was not a town until the sawmill came. It was, there was some settlement here, but it wasn't heavily settled until the sawmill came. And they actually used the river um, in the logging operations. They would build splash dams across the river and in high water times, they would um, um, build the splash dams, load the river up with logs, then break the splash dams to run the run the logs down from north of Helen into where the sawmill was in, in the Helen Valley. So that they used, used it uh, that way during the sawmill period. And then uh, after the sawmill left, uh, left Helen, it, um, there was kind of a slower period and it was mostly agriculture. And, and of course, you know, the, the river contributes to the, to the great soil here, uh, Nakuchi Valley and it, even in the Helen Valley, there was, um, a good bit of agriculture happening uh, during that time. And of course, after that, the next evolution evolution was the uh, tourism. And uh, the Alpine theme was adopted in 1969. And I think it was kind of a pipe dream, honestly, and it's but it obviously is taken off <laughs> beyond uh, beyond anybody's imagination. And along with that came the, the tubing. I remember as a child, um, we, would, we would get black inner tubes from a, from a gas station, have to patch it up, and we'd use that tube all year round. Yeah, and this was, this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, tubing was happening even then, but now it's become a full-blown industry. And uh, for better or worse, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, had an impact one way or another on the river, in some ways better actually. Um, I remember as a kid tubing down the river and seeing car bodies and tires in the river, and a lot of that type of pollution has gone away as far as the the, the obvious stuff, and it's kind of been replaced with flip flops and water bottles uh, from the tubing uh, activities. But they're they're trying. I mean, the tubing companies do try to keep it cleared out. Uh, but I think there's just so many, there's, there's so many people on the river on any given summer, you know, Saturday or Sunday, it's, it's hard to keep a, keep a handle on. And that's one of the, one of the things that Helen has had to deal with over the years, uh, recently. I mean, you talk about the most recent kind of big development in Helen being the city itself. Um, I wonder if anyone, you know, as we're tubing down the river, exploring the river up there, are, is there any evidence of some of these sawmills or the, the Georgia gold rush that we can still see today? There's not much left. There's, there's, um, th there was a train track, there was a train, the Gainesville Northwestern Railroad actually followed along the river as it approached Helen to the sawmill. And there, you can still, there's the Hardman, uh, the Helen to Hardman Trail is actually on the railroad bed of that, uh, of that railroad, the uh, Gainesville Northwestern. That's that's still there, and you can actually walk on that trail, and, and that's kind of a neat neat little uh, uh, relic, I guess, or artifact. But but there's not a whole lot left of the sawmill where where uh, where the Wendy's, if you're familiar with Helen, where Wendy's is now is about where the sawmill was, but it took up a big, a much larger area than, than Wendy's. It, it took up that whole you know that whole little area right there. But they all they had a, a, a log pond. Uh, that's, but it's, it's all been developed. It's all pretty much been, in fact, the last, the very last house that was associated with the sawmill was torn down about three years ago. And that's where the, where the Alpine roller coaster is now. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I know exactly where you're talking about, but I didn't yeah. know uh, they had such history. 
Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with us uh, that we may not have gotten to before we move on to the Lake Lanier portion of the webinar? I know you showed your book. We can definitely link yeah, to that can, uh, later. Yeah, this is a book I did about Helen. This is actually, uh, I mentioned my grandfather who was a civil engineer and a surveyor for the sawmill. And this, this is actually him looking upriver towards uh, Robertstown, north of Helen. Um, and this was his property at the time. And actually, I live in the house that he he was in when he was here in Helen. He didn't build the house, but uh, it's about a hundred year old uh, house that I live in now. So my, my roots are pretty deep. I, I could tell more stories if we had more time. Well, thank you, David. I wish we did, but hopefully we'll have some extra time at the end, you know, for questions. So if yeah. anybody has anything they else they want to know about Helen, uh, we'll definitely have some time later. Um, but we'll share, you know, contact information, stuff like that uh, after the webinar. So thank you, thank David. You. Uh, I think we're going to downstream now with the help of another David. Um, we're going to talk about Lake, Lake Lanier. So David, I don't know if you can. Yep, I see you. Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so David, thank you for being here. If you don't mind going ahead and telling us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with Lake Lanier. Um, I'm a native of North Carolina. I moved here in 1982 to take a teaching position in Forsyth County. And um, I worked during the summer, I worked as a park ranger for the Corps of Engineers. Did that until 2005. And then nine, 1998, I published a book on the lake's his early history uh, and took a job as a dispatcher here after I retired from education um, in I think 2010. So. so it sounds like you would know a lot about this area then so um, I guess I'll just dive right into the questions um, you know starting at the very beginning how how did Lake Lanier come into existence how does it you know, how did it become the lake we all know and love today? Well, it was part of early, um, the early part of the book covers the early history of the lake and the development of it through the rivers and harbors legislation was passed by Congress. And um, a bill that went through the House, U.S. House of Representatives had a, th a report, 308 report. And this basically was the spark that ignited the boom of construction all over the United States. And it just happened that the ACF river system, the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint river system, uh, Lake Lanier is just one part of it. it. I think it was the second project built on the on the river, uh, Chattahoochee River, and along with the Jim Woodruff. And then there ended up being five public works projects constructed uh, on the river, along with the private entities that uh, that own dams and lakes there. Um, so I've read some stuff and maybe you've read it too, um, about Lake Lanier being called the most popular lake in the world. Um, considering its origins that you just mentioned, you know, it, it did come about as a result of, um, some legal act, well, not legal actions, but, you know, laws and such. Um, why do you think it is as popular as it is and it has become this hub of tourism for our region? Well, it's the largest lake solely in, within the borders of Georgia. Part was larger, but it's shared with South Carolina. And it's close proximity to Atlanta, the region of Atlanta that's probably made it so popular. Recreation, although it wasn't a primary resource when they built it or reason for building it, has probably become a large resource for the lake's popularity. Uh, all the things that you could do with the lake, swimming, fishing, boating, you know, whatever. Uh, and it has generated a lot of income, large tax base, and it's provided a water source for the area. The development of this region, there's no way this area could have developed like it has commercially, residentially, without the water. It simply would not be possible. So without the lake, you wouldn't have that. So you mentioned some of those industries that the lake supports. Can you tell us a little bit about those and how long some of them have been in the area um, as a result of the well, lake? Well, prior to the lake being built, Lake Lanier, downstream, there was only one uh, large uh, industry and that was Georgia Power Plant uh, that produced power. The lake, uh, the Chattahoochee River is given to extremes. You Sometimes you have too much water, sometimes you don't have enough and industries uh, would not construct or build large 
plants on the river valleys for fear of the flooding or not having enough water to operate. So you had to have a stable, uniform body of water downstream from the lakes, and which is what these reservoirs produced. When there's too much water, they held the water back. When there's too little, they released it. So without these lakes, you wouldn't have the development that you've got the industry or even the residential uh, development that you've got in the area. Yeah, it's definitely played a big role. Um, I know we do have some pictures you sent over if you're ready to talk about those. Can I go ahead and share mm -hmm. them? All right, let's see. Okay, can you guys see this black and white photo? This is an aerial photograph taken uh, just after they finished the earth dam. Everything you see below the dam is the lake now. And then everything that you see in the upper portion, upper right, is still pretty much looks still like it does today, although there's some growth, some change in it. But they were had just finished the dam here, and before long, they'd be impounding the water and creating Lake Lanier. And this, they started creating the lake in 1956. They shut the gates and and reduced the flow through the down through the Chattahoochee River, and it caused the river to to back up, and the impoundment process started started in 1956 and they were almost near full pool in 19 summer 58 but because the lake moves up and down depending on the seasons they didn't reach normal pool until may 1959 which was a 1070 at the time they changed that later to 1071. wow okay yeah looks pretty different um i'll share our next photo if that's okay How about this one? This is this a is picture of Chattahoochee was flowing through the, uh, the um, four, four bay excavation. They had to ex excavate these large canals or, uh, or conduits to allow the water to go through the intake structure into the powerhouse and back below the river. Plus they had to do divert the river because they had to build the main earth dam. So if you're looking at the river in Forsyth County side of the dam, and this is what the area, the lake bottom looks like today. Uh, if, you, if you were to reverse this picture and look to the powerhouse side, that pretty much looks like it does today, but this is where this this would be covered underwater with the lake eventually would uh, would impound and cover over almost everything you see in this photograph. Okay, cool. Next up, I know we have I think two more. This one looks pretty intense. Where where is this located exactly? This is the intake. If they, that the former, the previous picture, if you were to turn around and and look down, the, you're looking at the Chattahoochee River flowing into the in, bottom of the intake structure, and this is all covered by water today. But uh, it did, the water flowing through the through the intake into the powerhouse didn't affect the water the work being taken place above the intake. So they're basically slowly building this concrete con, uh, monolith until it's it reaches the top of the of the hillside in the background. But all this is underwater today. This, this is probably the, one of the deeper areas of the lake right in here today, you can't see this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You mentioned it's all underwater. I feel like everybody who goes to Lake Lanier, you don't realize the, I mean, huge features of engineering and construction that had to take place underwater in order to, to bring this lake into existence. Correct, it's most of it is hidden um, beneath the water. Yeah, pretty cool nonetheless. Um, we got this one. I know we have a video as well. So this is, I guess, another picture of the dam. This is an aerial photograph. You're looking upstream towards the lake. You can see the lake forming in the background. Um, you can see the little islands and the, and the different uh, landforms that are being inundated daily. And the area that you're looking at directly behind the dam is probably the West Point, uh, West Bank Park today. But this is what it looked like when it was filling up. It just overtook more and more dry lands and wells that had been been dormant for years suddenly sprung to life because the water table was increasing by the the process of impounding and creating Lake Lanier and then what you see below in the bottom you see is the the riverside or grassed area of the main earth dam awesome 
Thank you. And I know we have a video as well. I'm going to try and share it. Y'all bear with me. I don't think there's any sound though. No, so. it, uh, it's a home movie made. <laughs> and this is their Earth Dam. They're building it. And, um, and you're looking below the dam here and you can see they're, they're layering rocks on top of the uh, lake side of the dam, which helps, the, you know, helps with the erosion uh, problems. But but this just this was taken from the Gwinnett County side of the dam, looking towards what would be the lake eventually, and they're just uh, you can show you, it just shows you what's beneath all the all the water. Uh, this this photograph was taken in about 1955, and you can see Sawney Mountain in the background, and you're looking towards Forsyth County side of the dam. This is Buford Dam Road today, and um, the book was published, a, a storybook site, Lake Lanier's Early History, was published in 1998. And if you go to lakelanierhistory.com, you can purchase the book and you can also get more historical information on land and other things that are uh, related to the history of the lake. Okay, cool. David, that was a lot of good information. I, I know we're getting some good feedback on those photos. So I appreciate you sending to, them to me so that I could share. Um, I think we'll just keep moving downstream if it's okay with you. Um, but if you are able to stay on for questions in case any come up later on, um, I certainly appreciate it. You're welcome. Enjoyed it. David. Um, okay, next up, we are we have made our way towards Metro Atlanta. Uh, Joe Cook uh, is going to be talking to us a little bit about the Civil War and the river uh, throughout history. Um, Joe, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, um, I grew up about a mile from the river in Vinings, uh, grew up running through the woods and uh, looking at what we were told were Civil War trenches. I don't know if they were or not, but we believe that to be the truth. Um, so I've always had a fascination with the uh, Civil War history uh, associated with the uh, Chattahoochee River. Uh, back in 1995, my wife and I traveled the length of the Chattahoochee from the headwaters all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico and wrote a book called River Song. It's a coffee table book about the river. And uh, with my work with Georgia River Network, uh, we've also produced uh, the Chattahoochee River User's Guide, which is a recreational guide to the river that was published just a few years back. So uh, Julie's in, invited me to uh, tell a few stories about uh, uh, the Civil War history along the river. I like to call it rebels and yanks getting naked in the river. <laughs> so, um, Judy, do you have any questions? You want me to dive in and tell you about some of the sites along the river that pertain to Civil War history? Exactly. Yeah, if you don't mind just dive in. And that was going to be my first question is that even us going on patrol here, we do see a couple sites that we know as part of Civil War history. But if you could name a few for us and explain, explain their significance. Okay, that'd be great. well, why don't I share the screen so you won't have to look at me. Chris Manganala has already told me I look like I just woke up. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, that way you don't have to look at me. I assume now you're seeing a picture of McAfee Bridge, uh, which is at Holcomb Bridge Road uh, near Roswell. Is everybody seeing that? Yeah, looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank well, you. Um, the thing to remember about the Civil War and uh, the Atlanta campaign is that it was critical, not just militarily, but politically. It was taking place right before uh, the uh, presidential election in 1864. And uh, McClellan, who was the Democratic uh, um, presidential candidate, wanted to, uh, come to come to terms a peace agreement with the South. Uh, they were, the war was very unpopular in the North. Uh, it seemed to be a stalemate. Uh, the North was not making progress in subduing the rebels. And uh, so if McClellan had won the election, we might very well have two uh, countries uh, in the United States. But um, the capture of Atlanta was critical to uh, President Lincoln's reelection. And so Sherman's goal was to capture Atlanta before um, the uh, election in November. And so the Chattahoochee was the last 
physical obstacle between Sherman and the capture of Atlanta. So it became critically important. Um, and at the time, there were only really just less than a handful of bridges across the Chattahoochee and only a couple in the Atlanta area. The first one was McAfee's Bridge. Um, and you can see the remains of McAfee's Bridge if you look down downstream from Holcomb Bridge as you're crossing Holcomb Bridge Road. This was a wagon bridge um, in Roswell. And then the other bridge was the uh, Western Atlantic Railroad Bridge down in Bolton. So uh, the battle lines were kind of drawn along the Chattahoochee. And I want to show you just a few spots along the Chattahoochee that played important roles in uh, the Atlanta campaign. Um, the next uh, slide, if I can get it changed, is um, Shalliford, um, which is about a half mile below where Vickery Creek comes into the Chattahoochee, kind of in the midst of um, Bull Sluice Lake, Morgan Falls uh, Dam and Morgan Falls Lake, Bull Sluice Lake. That was one of the spots where most of the, Ch uh, most of the uh, Union Army crossed the Chattahoochee to get the, to the south side of the river. So that's an important site. Um, and you can see that when you paddle upstream from Azalea uh, Park uh, on Bull Sluice Lake. And all the scenes that I'm going to show you were, were uh, engravings that were published in Harper's Weekly in 1864 depicting uh, the Atlanta campaign. And I've always thought this one was really interesting. The first time I looked at it, I was like, that doesn't look anything like the Chattahoochee. There is nothing like that looks like the Chattahoochee. But then I went to this spot, which is at Powers Ferry. And if you're on the running trail on the west side of the river, and you kind of look to the east side of the river upstream from Powers Ferry, there is actually kind of a ridge and bluff that looks very similar to this. And uh, this was an important site um, because the Union soldiers uh, were camped on the west bank of the river here. And uh, uh, a curious thing that one of them wrote about his station on the river was this. Um, it was Colonel Brownlow, and we'll get back to Colonel Brownlow in just a minute. He said, there are five large fish traps in this ford, and the river produces ab an abundance of fish. However, we can only get them by visiting the trap under cover of night. And that was because the Confederate sentries on the uh, east bank of the river would shoot at them um, if they tried to uh, enter the river. Uh, so that was a site where you had uh, Confederate soldiers on one side and uh, Union soldiers on the other. Well, Colonel Brownlow was charged with uh, taking a band of men across the river there at Cochran Shoals and Powers Ferry to try to uh, try to um, gain hold of the island there at Powers Ferry. If you've ever gone to Powers Ferry uh, in the National Recreation Area, you know you have to cross a bridge to an island and then walk across that island to the launch there on the Chattahoochee to launch your canoe, your kayak, or your raft. Well, that island, Colonel Brownlow was charged with taking uh, so that they would have a foothold closer to um, the east side of the river. So Colonel Brownlow came up with this idea that he would get some of his men, they would strip naked, they would put all their gear in a canoe and go across the river under cover of darkness and surprise the rebels uh, on the uh, east bank of the river. And they were successful in doing that and they were actually able to um, gain a foothold there on the, on the south bank of the river. And one of the commanding officers uh, after the successful raid of Brownlow's naked uh, Yankees, uh, one of the commanding officers wrote about the incident and he said, we would have had more, but the rebels had the advantage of running through the bushes with their clothes on. So they were able to capture several uh, Confederate soldiers and get a foothold on the other side of the river. Um, and then kind of in early to mid July of 1864, there was a time when uh, both the Union Army and the Confederate Army were stationed on both sides of the, on opposite sides of the river, and there was kind of a truce. 
And during that time, the soldiers fraternized with each other across the river. They would get in the river and bathe and swim. They traded tobacco and magazines and newspapers. Um, so the river was, uh, you know, kind of after they'd been fighting for months against each other, um, they enjoyed the river together for two or three days. And Ger General Sherman himself actually went down to the river and took a bath in the river uh, near uh, Pace's Ferry, basically where uh, the canoe restaurant is today. Uh, that was probably about the location where General Sherman actually got in the river and took a bath in the river during that hiatus when there was no uh, fighting. Of course, a few days after that hiatus of fighting, the Battle of Atlanta was fought uh, and 8,000 soldiers were killed. Um, going down a li little bit further uh, down river into uh, Carroll County, there's a place called Moore's Bridge. And Moore's Bridge was built by the famous bridge builder, Horace King, who was a slave uh, who earned his freedom and became one of the most prolific bridge builders in the Southeast. And he was a part owner of Moore's Bridge and uh, a Confederate, or excuse me, a Union cavalry raid um, captured Moore's Bridge. But then when the Confederates learned of the cavalry raid, uh, the Confederates came over and attacked and the uh, Union cavalry retreated and burned the bridge. And there's a new park there in Carroll County called Moore's Bridge Park. Uh, and you can see the site of that old bridge there. And then finally, a little bit further down river is a place called Hollingsworth Ferry. There is a DNR boat ramp there, uh, and it is uh, located at Plant Wansley, the Georgia power plant, uh, coal-fired power plant, Plant Wansley, on the Carroll County side of the river. And um, that was a location where um, the Union Cavalry, after raiding uh, across the river uh, towards Noonan, and towards the Flint River to try to destroy railroad um, lines going into Atlanta. There were several cavalry raids around um, Confederate lines and around Atlanta that attempted to destroy railroads so that supplies couldn't be uh, sent to uh, Atlanta. And many of those were somewhat successful. None of them were ultimately successful. But one of the least successful uh, was McCook's raid. And uh, at the Battle of Brown's Mill uh, in Noonan uh, in Coweta County, the uh, Union Army or Union Cavalry was just decimated. And they scattered to the west trying to get across the Chattahoochee River, because if they could get across the Chattahoochee River, they would get to safety. And Colonel Brownlow, who, re uh, who um, organized the naked raid up at uh, Cochrane Shoals and Powers Ferry, led a group of men to Hollingsworth Ferry, and they escaped across the river uh, just in the nick of time as uh, the Confederate Army was uh, bearing down on them. And Colonel Brownlow again escaped mostly naked across the river uh, at Hollingsworth Ferry and was able to return back to the Union headquarters up in uh, uh, the Smyrna and Marietta area. So there's multiple locations along the Chattahoochee um, that, uh, uh, you can visit and uh, get a taste of that uh, Civil War history. It's fascinating stuff. And a great book, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no, you can't. I'll hold it there. It's called Sherman's Horseman, and it is written by Daniel Evans. And it is a just a wonderful book about uh, the cavalry raids uh, and the Union Army's activities during the Siege of Atlanta. Just a fascinating read, and I would highly recommend it to anybody uh, that was interested in the Civil War history along the Chattahoochee and in the Atlanta area. Thank you, Joe. A um, lot more history and a lot less clothes than I expected in that section. It's clear everywhere you turn down here, there's a piece of history. Um, and I do wanna stress again that your book is such a great reference point. Um, for folks looking to get involved and looking to learn a little bit more about the river down in this stretch. Um, so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, if you don't mind staying on, if anybody has any questions, feel free to share them here in the Zoom chat or the comments, and then we'll probably get to them towards the end. 
Next up, I want to introduce Daryl uh, with the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. He is a great friend of Chattahoochee Riverkeeper. We work with him all the time, um, but he does clearly have excellent knowledge of the river um, and um, you know Proctor Creek, some of the other creeks that exist in the watershed uh, towards the western side of Atlanta. So Daryl, if you're there and can hear me, do you mind telling us no, a little I'm bit good. about yourself? Thank you. I've got, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. You can hear you. Excellent. I just got a few slides and uh, I want to thank Joe for adding that human element because uh, I'm going to follow up and kind of keep that thread going um, and talk a little bit about the West Side Creeks that uh, flow into the Chattahoochee. So my name is Daryl Haddock. I'm an environmental scientist and environmental education director for the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. And I guess what's interesting about my background is I'm originally from New Jersey. My wife's from Atlanta, Southwest Atlanta. So I tell people I'm married in to the work that I'm doing. But I played in uh, urban creeks as a kid. Tony's Brook was a creek that we had uh, in Essex County. Um, I was in living in Montclair at the time. And that was a creek that I could follow through three towns and two small cities. Um, and so I guess I grew up with this love of, you know, following water and exploring water and creeks that led to the work that I'm doing now. So the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance is an urban community-based organization. We're made up of African-American residents living in the Proctor, Utah, and Sandy Creek watersheds. All the three watersheds are in West Atlanta, both North and South. And these communities are most inundated with the cumulative environmental stressors that led to the impacts uh, that we later discussed in the Chattahoochee. These communities were coming um, front and center with some of those environmental stressors actually before they reached the, the, the river. And so Wawa stepped up as a community voice to focus on collecting those stories, to um, evaluate and assess the impacts of the environmental challenges that these communities were experiencing, but also lift up solutions and make sure that we were at the community, uh, at the decision-making tables. Uh, Utoy Creek is a sub-basin of the Chattahoochee that uh, runs for about 26 miles. Um, Proctor Creek runs about nine miles from downtown and Sandy Creek is the smallest watershed that we steward, which is about four miles, a little over uh, 4.9 miles. I'll share a slide that shows where our watersheds are in relation to downtown. Uh, you can see the Chattahoochee River is just west of I-20 um, and uh, 285. And so all of these watersheds with Utah being the largest have similar impacts, have similar challenges with respect to uh, water quality, but also some of the other environmental injustices that we know we're experiencing. We have uh, impacts such as uh, landfills, uh, there were active quarries, Superfund sites, the railroad yard, especially the Inman railroad yard, the highways, the, ur uh, the urban development, and, and, and all of these um, urbanizing impacts led to challenges that the community began to experience very early on in Atlanta's history. Um, I think one of the major things that the city and its residents experienced on the west side was the combined sewer. The fact that we had a combined sewer uh, where stormwater and sanitary sewage was in the same pipe. And after heavy rains, uh, the pipes capacity would be exceeded and flooding would occur uh, of this untreated sewage into these communities was a, a major challenge that the area um, ex experienced and to some extent, a much lesser extent uh, experiences today. Um, we do have deep tunnels and other types of great infrastructure that have made considerable improvements, but we still see several challenges that have a tendency to um, slow the development and the economic um, improvements that we would like to see in the west side. So this is a little bit of this slide highlights some of our impact. We really consider ourselves to be environmental educators, watershed educators that really reference and, and highlight stewardship. 
We want communities to be able to see themselves, as I said, as part of the solution, sharing their, their local knowledge, sharing their lived experiences, also connecting those urban youth and adults of color to nature, exposing them to their urban forests and watersheds. We like to call our work K to gray instead of K-12 or a lot of uh, experiential education, environmental education simply addresses kind of our school age youth. We're intergenerational. And lastly, we encourage our youth and adults in these underserved communities to be more aware and sensitive to those surroundings so they can work toward effective just solutions. Um, we train through place-based culturally responsive environmental education. We really see ourselves as educators. You know, we, we do get into a lot of you know, activism work, but it's highlighting the fact that education and science is one of the lenses that uh, we leverage and we use to bring about those just solutions, uh, which is really where we feel as we're strongest. This is a picture of where we operate from, the Outdoor Activity Center. It's in the Utoy Creek watershed. We steward just below 400 acres of green space. Um, the Outdoor Activity Center allows us with the other properties to really have a living laboratory where we can take visitors who come to these properties out. We have uh, water quality and um, citizen science projects that we can do from this location as well as from the other properties. And we were able to move a lot of that work into the Proctor Creek watershed and really see improvements collaborating with the, the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper on monitoring and evaluating what those stressors look like. We also design our environmental education program to highlight the forest, emphasizing water and trees as being those primary um, water quality solutions. Uh, most people don't think of trees as being part of green infrastructure, part of the, the, the very fabric of how um, green infrastructure has ecological benefits. And so when we model or mimic those ecological benefits, those services that are provided by nature, we can actually accelerate improvements to our water quality. We also convene through uh, community engagement, uh, citizen advisory uh, groups. Uh, we focus very heavily in the Project Creek watershed, helping to start and convene the Project Creek watershed but a lot of the work we do in the other watersheds uh, have continued to also engage community residents to be able to speak in their own voices, to be able to have the capacity, the efficacy to stand on our shoulders, hopefully, with the information and the support that we provide that allows them to show up and bring solutions to bear in a just manner. Uh, the Project Creek Water, uh, the Project Creek Stewardship Council has really seen um, national acclaim for the work that they've done, um, speaking in conferences, um, doing uh, research and data with some of our academic institutions, and really showing the power of community to solve uh, the problems that they're facing. A lot of times we, we, we don't oftentimes seek residents to speak in their own voice and be part of the solutions. We oftentimes kind of want to go to the subject matter experts. We kind of want to go to the scientists, but I think that we've got to also recognize that people's lived experiences are valuable in terms of the their experiences being part of the data. And so I think that it's very important that we highlight and, and work with communities so that they have the capacity and efficacy to speak in their own voices. Uh, one of the things that I want to kind of close out on before there might be some questions for us is that the most resilient thing that I think about in terms of the last 25 years that WOW has been doing this work is the resiliency of the community. I really want to stress the fact that these community members have for decades spoken to, fought on, fought off these environmental challenges, including flooding, and they really need to be uh, front and center as we build these just solutions and not experience things like gentrification, which may move them out. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I love what you said about people's experiences and stories being just as important as the data. 
Um, and I think that's especially important on this subject, on the subject of history and the Chattahoochee watershed and the creeks that surround it. So thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, and thanks for sharing what you're doing and thanks for doing it. So we certainly appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll have some questions for you a little bit towards the end. Um, so we're gonna keep on moving downstream. Uh, south of Atlanta is what we call the middle Chattahoochee region. Um, Chattahoochee River Keepers um, mid chat director, Henry Jacobs is here and he's gonna talk to us um, a little bit about the mid chat. So Henry, if you don't mind turning on your video and unmuting yeah. yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, yep, glad to be a part of this. Um, yeah, yeah, glad to, to follow. Uh, Good historians, and um, I'm going to keep keep it brief. Um, just share a few things about the Middle Chattahoochee region, um, and then I know we have one more, um, Chris Manganello, and then yeah, hopefully there'll be time for some questions. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and um, I've just got a few slides and images that I kind of want to share. First, this is uh, this is. Um, just to kind of my my history, uh, whatever credibility, I guess you would say. Um, the one thing I can claim is I I earned a history degree at Lagrange College. Um, oh, it's been like eight eight years now. But um, the focus of my senior paper um, was about West Point Lake and kind of the as you can see by the title, the urban appropriation of the rural South and. Um, kind of writing this paper really kind of led me to then find Riverkeeper and get to do an internship over the summer after graduating from college. And then now I, I feel so lucky that I've been working full time for Chattahoochee Riverkeeper for the last eight years now um, here in LaGrange and in the region. But but yet this the, the paper, um, you know, it was just interesting to find out that one of the big reasons West Point Lake was formed on the Chattahoochee River as a reservoir was because uh, planners um, believed that Atlanta was growing so much, not only did it need Lake Lanier as a source for the suburbs to go out for recreation, but they, they felt that West Point Lake was going to be an important and big recreational resource for, for the south side of Atlanta, um, not just, you know, as well as for the rest of the region like LaGrange and Noonan and even into Alabama. Um, but kind of the one thing they didn't uh, think about was water quality, which when West Point Lake was formed in the, the 70s and through the 80s and 90s really kind of suffered from poor water quality. But um, thanks to Riverkeeper that and, and a lot of other folks working together in the 90s and, and really the last 20 years now, West Point Lake is is clean and, and healthy, and we want to keep it that way. Um, I'm just going to flip through, um, you know, just thinking about the middle Chattahoochee region. Um, we settled, or I say we, you know, um, folks who immigrated to this country in the, the 1800s, you know, this area um, was used, you know, for, for farming and then for the textile mills really popped up and and you know, water being such a, um, a powerful kind of um, thing that was harnessed um, to create electricity and to, 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 to power these mills that really dominated the, the middle Chattahoochee region. Um, and then you know, just a, a reminder that before you had these reservoirs up and down the river, you know, it was, it was um, the river. And so this is, if, for folks familiar with West Point Lake, um, if they've been to Glass Bridge Park, this is the, the old covered bridge uh, that spanned the river. And this photo was taken, um, I think, in the 50s. And then, of course, West Point Lake was formed in 1974, one of the last kind of major big federal reservoir projects in the country. Um, and, you know, this photo, I actually, I was on a, on a flight coming back into Atlanta and they, they flew over West Point Lake and I got excited and took some photos from the, the plane window and you can see West Point Lake kind of in the foreground and then off in the distance that's the Chattahoochee River flowing out of West Point Dam past the city of West Point um, and in the distance you can actually make out Lake Harding um, and off to the left is the Kia plant if you've driven down I-85 
um, you'll recognize that. And you know that I just want to highlight too the fact that Columbus is, is such a uh, a big part of the Chattahoochee River, um, and you know one of the largest cities in Georgia, and and it it, it is there because of the river. Um, and again, you know the mills just harnessing the power. Um, and um, I know we uh, we were hoping Virginia Kazi would would join us today, but she had some other things to attend to. But I just want to highlight, um, she's the author of a recent history of Columbus, Georgia called Red Clay, White Water and Blues. And it just gives a kind of great dig into the, the history of the city and its connection to the river and, and so many other things in that area. Um, and then the last um, little kind of history tidbit I wanted to share um, is kind of an interesting anecdote I came across while researching for my paper in college about, about West Point Lake and, um, and everything that went into the authorization by Congress to, you know, to build a dam on the river. And, and um, one thing I discovered was that you know, the river historically has had a lot of steamboat barge traffic. Um, going back to the 1800s, Columbus was kind of the, the, the furthest you could go you know, if you're coming off the Gulf of Mexico at Apalachicola and then going upriver, you could get all the way to Columbus before you hit a big set of shoals. And um, there was planners, um, especially right after World War II, you know, um, in the 1950s, kind of the sky's the limit for, for the country and for planning and building. A lot of dams are being built in the 50s and 60s and and people are getting ambitious. And um, the plan was that along with, you know, Lake Seminole, Lake Eufaula, and then Lake Harding going up to West Point Lake on the river, getting closer to Atlanta, there was two more proposed uh, dam projects above West Point Lake with the idea to make Atlanta a port city. And um, for about 10 years or so in the plans, this was, highlighted and city planners in Atlanta were excited to, to become a port city. Um, but ultimately um, that, that idea, I think that it came back down to reality and realized that, you know, the Chattahoochee River, especially as you get to Atlanta is, is only so big and we all need water. Um, and so it just wasn't feasible to create that, those two more reservoirs that would make Atlanta a port city. So, I'll pause there. I want to make sure there's enough time and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, I thanks for over. sharing, Henry. Those photos are awesome. And I will say, you know, they kind of illustrate the difference of the Chattahoochee in this region compared to how the river looks in the headwaters. It's just, it looks like a totally different river almost. And I think that stands as a testament to, you know, not only the size of this river, but how different it's been developed differently it's been developed um throughout all 435 miles and joe posted uh, a trivia question here in the in the chat it says what city is the queen city of the chattahoochee and apparently you showed a picture of a steamboat that was called the queen city so i wonder if you know or joe if you'd be willing to tell us do you want to take a guess oh, man yeah you put me on the spot i don't know, I know. <laughs> I mean, I would guess Columbus. Is that right, Joe? Um, well, people can type in if they have any guesses. I don't want to give it up just yet. No, that's my guess. Does anybody else want to take a take a shot at this? I'm gonna put it in the chat. We can always come back to it, but I did want to throw it out there since you just shared it. So y'all be thinking on it. Um, and maybe in the meantime, we can go to Chris, um, our water policy director, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the ongoing water wars, which are definitely a big part of the Chattahoochee's history. So Chris, if you're there, if you don't mind sharing your video and unmuting yourself. That sure thing. Great. Good to see everybody. Thanks for being here um, and uh, for hanging on to the very end here. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, kind of talk through um, the uh, water wars here and let's see. Let's see, that is not sharing my screen. We can see it now. 
it looks oh, like. Oh, you can. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Um, all right. See the full screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, uh, again, for joining. Um, I'm Chris Manganello. I am uh, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper's uh, Water Policy Director. Most of the stuff I do is I track water supply planning, um, legislative process, all with the intent of making sure there's enough clean water for uh, people and uh, critters, uh, you know, people upstream, downstream, uh, regardless of what state you live in, uh, just make sure there's enough for all of us. Um, and obviously, um, one of the other things I track is the water wars. And you know, before I, 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 I kind of get into that, um, the one thing I just wanted to show, uh, is talk about real quick, um, you know, the Chattahoochee River, it's a workhorse. Um, you know, it's a part of this larger ACF system, uh, Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint Basin. Um, you know, the Flint River is kind of the section in brown here. Uh, the Chattahoochee in blue and brown, they, they come together and they form uh, the Apalachicola River, which empties out ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, you know, the river, um, like I said, you know, it, it, it's a workhorse, uh, the Chattahoochee itself, there are over 5 million people in the basin uh, that depend on it, uh, over 100 wastewater treatment plants. There are 11 dams, uh, many produce electricity, and then there's coal, um, at least one coal, coal plant left on the river, nuclear plant, gas plants, all generate electricity. We, we can't have electricity uh, without water unless you're on solar power or wind. Otherwise, you need water to make your electricity. And then, of course, you get uh, agriculture is really big throughout the region. You know, Lake Lanier, you know, we were talking about one of the things that um, an industry that uh, Lake Lanier helped make possible was the poultry industry. Um, they uh, need lots of water um, to this day. Um, and then certainly, you know, there's forestry, a lot of forestry in the middle of the basin. And then as you get further downstream is irrigated agriculture, cotton, peanuts, corn, kind of the, the big trinity in, in Georgia agriculture. And then of course, there's uh, recreation throughout the basin, um, you know, white water in, in Columbus. Uh, Lake Lanier and um, Chattahoochee National Recreation Area and uh, recreational angling for trout uh, below Lake Lanier and um, um, troll bass is kind of the kind of the trophy fish uh, as you get down near Columbus and, and further south. But but uh, the, the other kind of big piece of, of what makes this river workhorse um, is these red triangles or rectangles, excuse me, get my shapes correct. I should listen in more to my kindergartners virtual learning. Um, the um, red um, rectangles here, uh, they represent kind of the large U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dams. And, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers is a federal agency. Um, you know, as David was saying, you know, they started building uh, all these, these big dams in, in the Chattahoochee River Basin uh, beginning in the 1950s. Uh, and the one that kind of is the um, kind of the, the focus of attention, um, particularly when it comes to um, our relations with uh, Alabama and Florida is Lake Lanier. And that's the, the one all the way up at the top of the picture there, the red rectangle uh, up in the headwaters. And um, that's been, that lake there and all the water in it has been kind of the prize, um, uh, you know, and everybody wants, uh, you know, a little part of it. And so for over 30 years, uh, we've been kind of involved in this tri-state water war uh, over Lake Lanier. Here's another picture of uh, Lake Lanier um, and Buford Dam. We're looking at it from um, the uh, kind of basically looking at uh, from south to north. The Chattahoochee River in this, is the very bottom of the picture. Uh, it comes out of uh, Buford Dam uh, and that earthen dam there, and then that's Lake Lanier behind it. Um, but the, the water wars itself, um, as I said, really kind of starts over kind of how uh, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama would, would use Lake Lanier. And in the 1990s, um, Georgia um, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to reallocate part of Lake Lanier for metropolitan Atlanta's water supply. So we'd have drinking water. And this kind of uh, triggered opposition from Florida and Alabama uh, which said, no, Atlanta, you, you can't have all that water. Uh, Georgia, you can't use all that water. And so that kind of started uh, what we call the tri-state water wars between Alabama, Florida, and Georgia over you know, what this water in uh, Lake Lanier should be used for. There was a brief period of time when the three states attempted to kind of negotiate how they would use the lake. That ultimately failed. Um, and then in the um, early and in, in kind of uh, you know, up through 2012, there was a large debate over whether or not Lake Lanier was even authorized for 
for water supply, which was ultimately determined the answer to that is yes. And as soon as that was done, you know, the legal arguments up until that point had mostly been, been between the states uh, and, or, or I should say, you know, one state would sue the Army Corps of Engineers and then, you know, then another kind of legal suit would come up and a different state would sort the Corps. And so it was mostly the states trying to sue the Army Corps of Engineers over how they operated Lake Lanier and all the other lakes in the ACF basin. Until 2013, um, most of those cases had ultimately been decided um, up until 2013, had more or less been decided in such a way that were favorable to the state of Georgia. And so in 2013, Florida kind of didn't really have any other place to go. So they asked for um, the US, the United States uh, Supreme Court uh, to take a challenge um, it, over, you know, basically over interstate water management. Um, Florida had felt like they had run the course in other courts and other um, venues and legal venues. And so uh, going to the Supreme Court was kind of the last, the last um, option. Um, and so Florida, um, sued Georgia in 2013 saying, um, Georgia is using too much water. Um, they're not sharing it equitably. Uh, the target was mostly a metropolitan Atlanta and also agricultural use in the Flint River Basin in Georgia. In Georgia. And so Florida was asking for what's called equitable apportionment, uh, which would in kind of simple terms just was a way of saying, we want the Supreme Court to help share the water so that Florida uh, gets uh, what, they're deser what they deserve. Um, the case um, right now is um, it kind of went through this long process over the last seven years. Um, and um, in February, in a few weeks, um, the, uh, the case will be heard before the full Supreme Court. Uh, it will be broadcast, um, the audio will be broadcast live on C-SPAN. Um, and so you can, if you want to choose to listen in, we'll, uh, Chetty Trubakipa will be sharing uh, kind of how you can do that. Um, and this will be um, heard again in February, and then the anticipation, of the assumption is that by the end of um, July or J June or July of 2021, that the court will um, issue an opinion. Uh, and all signs are kind of pointing towards that this case will probably end at this point. Um, the briefs that have been going back and forth um, seem to indicate that Florida's um, um, legal argument may may not. Um, may not be the best uh, and it, um, it's so it's entirely possible that the Supreme Court may kind of uh, deny Florida its request which would essentially kind of throw the case out. Um, last spring, uh, Chad H. Uh, we did a, a, a much longer version of, of uh, Let's Chat specifically about the water wars. Uh, you can go on Facebook and find that in our video feed. It's also on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you have more detail or you are looking for more details about kind of the background and the history of the water wars, I recommend you, um, you can uh, check out those uh, presentations. Um, and I will go ahead and wrap it up there since we are over time. And I am happy to take other questions just like everyone else. Thanks, Chris. I did have You're one welcome. question I wanted to get to before we sure. opened it up specifically about the water wars. Um, yes. If we know that it's ongoing. We know that it's gone on for a really long time, but say 50 years from now, historians are looking back at the water wars what do you think this conflict signals about water conservation um, and how water is connected to multiple states and not just to one city? What, what do you think this will mean historically? Yeah, um, well, I, I think that um, one of the big takeaways will be um, that um, uh, Georgia will have um, been able to demonstrate from an evidence, uh, you know, for, for the sake of the argument at, 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 the, at the court level that they have implemented a lot of water conservation and efficiency um, requirements, um, both in urban and in agricultural settings. And I would say that um, I think somebody looking back will say, um, you know, certainly uh, Georgia made, has made a lot of improvements, but those improvements probably would not have happened if Georgia had never been sued in the first place, right? So if the water wars hadn't started in 1990, um, the speed with which maybe water conservation efficiency has been implemented in the state of Georgia um, without those legal cases probably would have been a lot slower. Uh, so in other words, the, the, the kind of constant threat of legal challenge and the ongoing legal challenges forced the state of Georgia to act. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's really helpful to know. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, cool. I think with that, yeah, we can open it up for questions. Um, if you want to turn your video on, you're welcome to share it in the chat, share it in the comments. Um, this can be for any of our presenters, not just Chris, or if you want to direct it specifically to um, one or more, you're welcome to. We did have one come up in the Facebook comments. This comes from Derek. He asks, can you talk about flat boats through Devil's Race Course? He was told that they dynamited the channel for navigation. So I think Devil's Race Course is in the mid chat. Is that right? Uh, Devil's Race Course is in the Chattahoochee River National Recreation mm -hmm. Area. It's located just below the I-285 bridge. Um, that is the story that I've always been told. I've never actually done any research to find documentation of that, but um, that's the story there. I don't know, somebody else might have uh, information about that. Uh, but that's what always has been told is that the uh, path through Devil's Race Force was blasted out for navigational purposes. I wish I had more background but on that, but I definitely do not. Um, maybe that's something we can look into and come back to at another webinar. I mean, I will definitely say that we have so much good content here. I, I wouldn't put it past us to in six months, maybe get back together and answer any questions that we didn't get to. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions here in the chat or comments, um, but Joe, I think you had a great trivia question. Maybe now is a good time to <laughs> revisit that. Yeah, uh, the queen city of the Chattahoochee was Fort Gaines, Georgia, which was one of the most important uh, river ports uh, during the 1800s aside from um, aside from Columbus and Apalachicola, but uh, yeah, the uh, city of Fort Gaines was the queen city of the Chattahoochee. I was wrong, I'll admit it, but that's a great trivia. I love it. We, we've we done uh, trivia as part of our member celebration here at CRK, and I think I think it's time for a rematch because everybody loves some good trivia. Julie? Um, oh yeah. I, I've got a quick question for the other David. Okay. Uh, have there ever been any studies or, or research about any uh, Native American settlements that may have been covered up by Lake Lanier? There were some archaeological sites that were uh, designated and noted uh, before the impoundment process began. Um, they marked them and put them on maps. They're not many, but a few, and not as many as you did for the projects that took place years later, like Hartwell, where they had a lot of archaeological sites identified. And they, right. when they started working on these sites, uh, they eventually would run out of time because once the construction started, you had maybe six, <laughs> seven years, and then you know the, the lake was started to form. But they could designate and knew where these sites pre these pre these. There's a there's a um, park on the lake called War Hill that used to be a campground for the Corps of Engineers. And uh, there was supposedly a um, Indian or Native American um, site there at some point in time. But they identified a lot of them. They just, when the lake formed, it covered these areas up. I have a follow up question. I had heard that uh, at Six Flags, at the amusement park off the river that there was also some indigenous mounds, um, but I haven't heard, found any historical, um, you know, research to, to verify that. David, have you heard that? Or has anybody heard that there were actually, you know, m more indigenous mounds or settlements along the river? I, I haven't, I don't have any information on that. I'm sure there probably were a lot all the way down uh, down to the Atlantic Ocean. I know I'm presently involved in doing work for Hartwell Dam, and there were a, there were a, a large number of um, sites that were identified uh, along the Savannah River and the Tugaloo and the Seneca Rivers as well. And they did probably a little bit better job of identifying them as time went on. 
so that they would ha have more information on these sites prior to the actual impoundment of the process to when it begin would begin. Daryl, there was one uh, mound uh, near Anawaki Creek, uh, where Anawaki Creek uh, meets the Chattahoochee. So I know of that one, but I don't know of any uh, by um, Six Flags, but that's close. That's definitely something we could look into more. And I feel like here at CRK, our uh, outings manager, Tammy Bates, and our riverkeeper, Jason Olseth, I feel like they've mentioned, um, as we've been out on patrol, some sites significant to Native American history. So maybe that's something we can check on um, and share after the webinar wraps up. Um, Jasmine Jackson just posted a question in our Zoom chat. She asks, is Alabama not involved in the water wars? Chris? Sure. Uh, it, Alabama is uh, not involved in the ongoing Supreme Court case. Alabama is involved um, currently in a challenge to what's called the water control manual for um, the ACF River Basin. Um, and so, I mean, there, there are kind of multiple legal cases going on, and, uh, but really the kind of the Supreme Court one is the is the big one uh, that I chose to focus on today. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Hopefully that answers your question, Jasmine. Um, with that, I know we are just slightly over time, but like I said, I feel like we could just talk all day about one or any of these subjects. Um, so thank you again to all of our presenters. I can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I personally have learned so much and I'm sure everyone watching here on Zoom and on Facebook feels the exact same way. We're already getting some great feedback. Um, like I said, maybe we can revisit this here in a couple months and dive into one or more of these topics with another webinar. Um, but until then, if you did register to watch here on Zoom, you will be getting an email later on today with a link to a recording of this webinar in case you just wanna watch it another time. And for everyone watching on Facebook, this um, live stream will be saved on our Facebook page, but um, we'll also follow up with a social media post here in a couple days um, with the video if you would rather watch it on YouTube. Um, feel free to email CRK, comment on our page um, with any other questions, or if you'd like a webinar on any other topics, please let us know. Um, we do these so that we can talk to everyone, you know, the Chattahoochee is used by so many people, it's depended on by so many people. So these webinars really are for you. And we just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, um, for asking your questions and for giving us your feedback. So with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope to talk to you again Love soon. It.